to see you folks today. Glad to have you in Sunday school for a change. I've been looking forward to the day that we got back in Sunday school. Uh, looks a little different in here with the pinball approach to uh, the seating, but we're glad that you're here. I hope you're as happy about Sunday school as I am. I've been really missing Sunday school, and, uh, and I'm just looking forward to Brother Abbott teaching us today and, and, uh, and all the different things that's going to be going on as we change back to normal. That's what I'm looking for, get back to what we call normal. And I'm sure we've got some folks that I don't recognize. They may be visitors, so I'm sorry if I've, you've been here a long time, <laughs> but we're glad to have you folks with us today. And uh, do we have any special prayer requests? Because we've not been having our group meetings, which, yes, ma'am. Would you give me her name? I'm sorry. And the last name was Lane. Okay. We hope in the next week or so that we'll get back to our group so the group captains can uh, take prayer requests and, and things like that. And if you know your group captain, you can get in touch with them since we don't have a a full-time teacher as of yet, but you can get in touch with your group captain and they can put you on the prayer list and, and uh, try to keep things going. Now, Mark normally does this opening of the mornings and he was had a little fever and he said he thought he'd better not come. Uh, so uh, you got stuck with me and you'll probably have a fever after I'm done. <laughs> but, uh, it is good to see all of you, and as more are coming in, we're just going to get ready for Brother Abbott. Brother Abbott, uh, for those of you who have never heard him or don't know a lot about him, yes, ma'am. Oh, you're... <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm directed. Oh, I thought you were get, had another request or something. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. Well, it's going to be hard, Brother Abbott, getting used to these chairs like this is. I don't know if you can keep looking around to all the different ones. And for those of you who are listening on live stream, we would love to have you next Sunday for Sunday school if you feel like that you could come out. Our pastor is being very observant about keeping people where they feel safe and wanting everyone to feel comfortable when they come to Sunday school and church. But I'm just glad that we're back in Sunday school. And I long for the day where our seats are back like they were and the people are fellowshipping like we used to. And uh, uh, it's just, it's good to belong to a good church though. You know, I, I miss Sunday school and I miss church. And so we're blessed to be part of a, a good, good church. So if you've never thought about that, well, you need to take that in consideration. When you're thanking the Lord for some of your blessings, this church is one of your blessings, whether you realize it or not. Uh, Brother Abbott uh, and his wife are members of our church here, and he's been in full-time missionaries, or they've been in full-time missionary service with BMI, BIMI since 1969, 51 years. So I think he's very well qualified to speak to us today. And uh, he's been in church planning in France for 37 years and a regional representative for BIMI since 2007. So that keeps him very busy too. And they've been members of Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church for nearly 20 years. And I was so glad when I heard that he was gonna be teaching today. I didn't know who was gonna be teaching. And uh, I've, every time I've heard him preach in a service, I can always say that I got a blessing from him because one thing he does, and that I really appreciate it, he preaches the word, and he'll teach the word. I remember a few Sundays ago when Brother Roulette, I think that's the way you pronounce his name, was here, was talking about Job, said he wished that God had given him a book. And that stuck with me, that God has given us a book. And any time we get away from that book, we're away from what we really need to know. 
You know, I listen to all this news stuff now. I listen to some of it. And it bothers me when I heard the other day that hospitals were reporting any type of death that happened that could be slightly heart attack or something like that. And they were reporting that as being part of a COVID-19 death cycle. Now, I hope that's not true, but if it is true, and they're doing that, they're falsifying these numbers that we're hearing by doing that. And they're doing that to get a little more government funding or something for the hospital. And if I, was, if I knew that was happening and I could prove that that was happening, I would call our hospital administrator out face to face because I think that's lying. And I think that's continuing this process and then the news just blows it on up more and more and more, but that's just an outright lie. And it's like, I'm in the RV business and, and I report my sales and stuff, and if I underreport them, you know what they'll do to me? They'll put me in jail for underreporting them uh, because I'm dealing with the tax people. Well, the hospital administrators and people that are in charge of reporting this stuff need to do it factually. I don't know a single person, not one, that I'm aware of that's died because of the COVID-19 virus. I don't know one. Now, maybe you all do, but I don't know a single one. I know a few people that think thinks they've had it, but they've not died. And so I'm just, I'm just really a little put out with people that's not reporting the truth. And that's what I like about Brother Abbott I love it about our pastor. They preach the truth. And we've got that book that Job was wanting, and it's all the truth. And that's why I like our church, because when you come here, we're going to hear what the Bible says. We, you know, sometimes if I'm teaching or speaking, I might give you my opinion. My opinion doesn't count for anything. It really doesn't. But what counts is God's Word. And I expect... Brother Abbott, I expect Brother Herman, and I, anybody that's standing up in front of our, our church body just to tell us the truth. That's all we want. And you know that's what America needs today. They just need the truth. They just need it reported exactly like it is. And if there's something that we don't like, if it's a the truth, then we're just going to have to learn how to deal with it. But I, I just don't like somebody falsifying any kind of records to say that, well, we've got to watch this, we've got to watch that, and everything else. And uh, so uh, now I may catch COVID-19 before I get home today, but if I do, well, then I will let you know that it's the real thing. <laughs> but anyway, I'm glad to have Brother Abbott here. And is there any other prayer requests? Some of you came in a little bit late. All right, let's go to the Lord prayer. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. And dear Lord, I thank you again for that book you've given us. I thank you for men and women that will stand up and teach and preach from that book and give us the truth. I pray for all the folks that couldn't be here today because they were feeling ill or having a hard time or maybe just afraid because of all this news they've heard about gathering together again and and, uh, and I believe that the devil was certainly pleased when we couldn't have Sunday school and church like we used to. And I pray that we will start appreciating it more now that we're getting back into it. And, and, uh, and I thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that you would help Brother Abbott as he teaches today to teach what you've laid on his heart. And I know you've laid the truth on his heart. I pray for... Charlotte uh, Lane, that you'll help her with this uh, dementia. Uh, it's a terrible sickness. I would rather have COVID-19 than to have dementia. And it's, uh, it's, I don't want either one of them, but Lord, I, I pray for her and for others from our church family that are shut-ins. I think Colby DeBusk and, uh, uh, and several others, Ms. Deacons and, and uh, Ms. Wampler and and others that are in nursing homes or rest homes or in uh, convalescent care, and they couldn't be here today as bad as they'd want to be. 
so maybe they can watch it on live streaming. And, and I pray for the folks that have unspoken requests today. And do be with Brother Abbott, be with Brother Herdman as he preaches today. And may this a day be a day that you're pleased with. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Abbott. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the introduction, Brother Stover, and just saying a few words on my behalf before we get started. Uh, some of you do know me fairly well, and others perhaps not at all or not quite. I appreciate the words of introduction. That'll help some folks to know where we are or who we are and all that sort of thing. And I'm glad to be with you once again and to be able to teach this class. I, I feel the. I can still feel Brother Gary standing here. I can still feel his presence and still miss him. Uh, deeply, and I would like to think that what I do today will honor the Savior, and I would like to think that if Gary was ever looking in, that he'd be pleased as well as my efforts to, to help a little bit and do what he was doing for so faithfully through the years. And uh, to be with you, some of you know, and uh, some of you might not, that uh, the reason why we're in the States is because of my mother. When you talk about uh, a loved one with dementia or Alzheimer's, that's what brought us back to the States after 37 years in France doing church planting work there. I'm the last surviving member of our family besides my mother, and so she uh, had her back to the wall. The doctor down in Georgia where she was was getting ready, ready to have my mom committed somewhere, and it was either come back and take charge of her or to just go ahead and let them put her in a home somewhere, do it ourselves, and I, I just couldn't bring myself to putting mom in a home. And so we came back to take care of her. I, that's what we had peace about doing and taking care of my mom at the house 24 seven there in our house in Kingsport. We didn't have a place to live. We had to sort of scramble to find a place to live and to bring mama up out of Georgia and bring her here to where she could come to church with us. And she did for a long, long while, but she hadn't been to church since September now. Her health has gone down. She's 100, by the way. She'll be 101 in September, 101 in September. So her health has gone down. She is losing muscle tone. She going down the hallway to her bedroom. She bounces off both walls. She can't walk a straight line to save her life. And uh, she falls all the time. And frankly, some of the men in the church here are getting kind of tired of having to pick her up. Uh, she's fallen on us five times, but she's fallen on us at the house or elsewhere uh, 25 or 30 times. And how she's not broken a bone, I'll never know. Uh, but she's uh, well padded. The Lord was with her. And she's not broken a bone. She's banged herself up pretty bad. We've had to take her to the emergency room before when she did and have uh, nurses come in to watch after when she banged herself up so bad. But uh, no broken bones, so we were able to take care of her, keep her going. And that's the reason why this morning my wife came to the 8.30 hour so I could stay with mom. And we, I took our, our pickup and came on for this service and crossed paths with my wife as she was hurrying home to to take uh, charge of my mom so I could be here. That's what we're having to do. Uh, somebody has to be with her 24 seven. So you understand that we got restrictions and the older my mom gets and the worse her health condition gets, uh, the more our care for mom has, has become intense, more and more intense and have to be closer than ever before. So uh, do pray for us. I'm glad to be here and I thank the Lord for the chance to be with you in this Sunday school class just a temporary fill-in. The pastor asked if I could do it, and I was free to do so. Uh, last week, at this time on Sunday, I was preaching in a church out east of Indianapolis. Uh, the pastor there asked me to come and preach a faith promise meeting for him. So Wednesday through Sunday, I was preaching faith promise in a church about halfway between Indianapolis and the Ohio border. And uh, they didn't have an evening service up there. They don't do that up there right now. They're just having morning only. So after the morning service, I ate a uh, bite quickly with some of the people of the church and made a beeline for Kingsport and got in about 10 o'clock Sunday night and uh, got back home to jump in and help Margie taking care of mom and mom had a doctor's visit on Tuesday morning so we got back home and got together again and ganging up on mom again <laughs> that's, that's what it takes it's kind of like tag team wrestling when one tags out one has to tag in both of us together as much as we can but always one or the other and so the Lord is keeping us busy, and I'm glad that this Sunday was available and free to be able to be with you this morning. Now, we're here to talk about the Lord Jesus this morning. I want to talk to you about how Jesus trusted the Father. And in our world in which we live today, and Brother Stover was absolutely correct, we're living in a, a crazy, mixed-up world today. 
And to be honest, our politicians don't know what to do. Our doctors don't know what to do. You and I don't know what to do because this is uncharted territory. In our lifetime, we've never lived through anything quite like this. The whole world is going through this. It's not just America. Uh, if you think it's tough here, our son Kerry in France, uh, that's our younger of our two boys, was born and raised in France, been a missionary back there for uh, 20 years now, went back in 2000. And uh, over there in France, to give you an idea of what it's like, that for them to leave their house, they have a right to leave their house one hour a day. And to do so, they have to get on the computer and get a printout that gives them permission to be out from this hour to that hour, to go to the grocery store, the doctor, to the garage, whatever. They can be out of their house, off their property, one hour a day. And uh, they can use that for the grocery store or whatever they want. But that printout will tell you. And the police stop people just at random to see their papers. We have one of our church ladies from our church at Sargamine. Now, this is a lady uh, going on 70, as sweet and a docile, simple, sweet lady. And she says, I was just going to see my mother. She, she was emailing me. She says, I've never been stopped by the police before. But I was going to see my mother. She's still at home, around 92, 94 years old. And the police stopped me and said, let me see your papers. And fortunately, she said she never used to know a thing about computers, but she got into computers and she got her printout and uh, had that printout with her. And he says, OK, I'll see your time. Now, you better be back on time. If I catch you out after this hour, you're in trouble. And uh, so they had one hour to go see her mother and get back home. And uh, so that's the way it is in some countries. They're far, far more strict than what we are here. So we ought to be glad to be able to come and do this and uh, be able to just be in the church today and enjoy one another's company, even if it is sort of spaced out a bit. But sometimes we're always, people tell me I'm always kind of spaced out, but, <laughs> but that's all right, that's all right. That's better than saying what they could about being scattered. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of scattered brain myself too sometimes, but we're taking the situation as it is, making the best of it, and God's going to bless it because God's not taken by surprise. We live in a time where we need to be able to have the right kind of faith and trust in God that will see us through all these crazy things going on today. We are in a crazy, mixed up world. And you and I had better know where our feet are grounded. We better know where we're standing. And we need to learn more about trusting God and looking to God and doing the right things according to the will of God. And where can you find a better example than in the Lord Jesus Christ himself? I'd like us to look this morning at how Jesus trusted the Father. Jesus didn't just go through life doing everything on his own off the cuff. He trusted the Father in some very specific ways. I want us to look at those things this morning. Turn over to our first passage. We'll look at probably about four passages this morning. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We'll be staying in the Gospels talking about how Jesus trusted the Father. How Jesus trusted the Father. And by the way, our son Kerry was telling me uh, not long ago, uh, we stay in touch all the time. He said that one day they decided to use their one hour permit. They didn't need a store or anything. And they were going down the sidewalk around their neighborhood just to walk, just to get out of the house and walk. You can do that with that one hour permit. And some guy opened up his window and says, what are you doing out there? Don't you know you're putting everybody in danger? Get back to your house where you belong. <laughs> he said, I got a permit. He said, I don't care. You're putting everybody in danger. Go home. <laughs> We're living in a crazy world. We're living in a crazy world. If you think we got it tough here, then you should try living in Europe right now. We can never find a better example on how to trust the Father than we can by what Jesus Christ himself did, what Jesus did. John 8, 28 and 29, those two verses. I'm sure you have your place by now, so follow those with me if you will. We're looking at about four passages. This is the first one this morning, John 8. 28 and 29, then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the son of man, then shall ye know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. What an incredible statement. Would you pray with me, please, before we stop and look at this a little deeper. <laughs> Heavenly Father, if the Lord Jesus always did that which pleased you, how much more should we as mortal humans 
want to do everything possible in our power to please you. If Jesus sought to please you, how can we not seek to please you? Dear Father, speak to our hearts this morning and help us to learn from this precious, magnificent example of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in learning how to trust you better. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Jesus said there in that last verse we just read, I do always. I double underline that word always because I can't say that. I can say that I do sometimes all that which pleases the Father, many times, often, most of the time maybe, I don't know, but I don't think I could put in my own testimony that I always do that which pleases the Father. But we should try. We should try. What did Jesus do to please the Father? He, he trusted the Father in everything. Everything. He didn't go by, even though he was God, God incarnate. Jesus didn't try to just operate on his own like a, a ship and a sailor just sailing his own way without any regard to anything around him. He went through life, his short brief time on earth, 33 and a half years or so, by trusting God to serve him, to live for him, follow him, obey him in everything. I do always those things that please the Father. I don't believe there's probably a person in the room that can say that. None of us do, always. That's the word that causes us problems. By the, word, by the way, that word trust in the Bible, uh, we find that word trust throughout the Bible. We're supposed to trust God and believe in God. And that word trust in, in the Greek where this was written in Greek is the word pytho, pytho. And it simply means to have confidence in. The word trust simply means from the word pytho that's translated trust throughout our New Testament, to have confidence in. So I'd like us to look briefly at three ways in which Jesus trusted the Father. I believe the first way we can see this morning is he trusted in the power of God. He trusted in the power of God. And you and I, if there's anything we need today, we need to be able to trust in the power of God. God is all powerful, but we don't act like we believe that sometimes. We forget that. Notice our second passage for this morning. It'll be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, if you will, please. Mark 11. And we'll notice, uh, first of all, verse 22. Mark 11, 22. Very simple. These are simple passages and simple lessons to learn from those passages. It's not like I'm going to hit you with any bolt of lightning out of the blue. Well, I've never heard of that or thought of that before. No, these are simple reminders of what we see in Jesus that we can tell we need for ourselves. So chapter 11 and uh, verse 22, we see this very short, simple verse. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Now that's a whole sermon right there. We could preach a whole sermon in those four words, have faith in God. He wasn't telling the disciples to do something he wasn't doing himself. He said, don't you forget to have faith in God, even though I don't. Hard, that's hardly the case. He was telling them to have faith in God. And we say, I know that. I need to do that. I, I think I do that. Think? Yeah, well, sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. But he's reminding the disciples. Sometimes they did, but sometimes they didn't. So Jesus saw the importance of reminding them to have faith in God. Why is that? Turn to chapter 14. You're just a page or so away, a page or two away from chapter 14. You're there in Mark 11. Turn to chapter 14 and notice the two verses, 35 and 36. Chapter, yeah, Mark 14, verses 35 and 36. And he went forth a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. He knew that God could have snapped his finger and Jesus could have gotten his prayer answered. All he had to do was just say, Father, I don't want into this anymore. I've changed my mind. Stop the whole process. And God could have done anything Jesus would have asked. So Jesus knew that he could ask of the Father anything he wanted. He said, let this cup pass from me, if you will. Nevertheless. Not my will, but thine. Because he knew he could trust the power of the Father to do great things, but he had to trust the will of the Father in that power. He was teaching his disciples about the power of God. 
God can do anything. He trusted the Father to be able to meet every one of his needs, and he was teaching the disciples that the Father can meet every one of your needs. Are we trusting in the power of God today? With all that's going on around us, and even before this virus thing hit, uh, we had problems and needs and burdens and struggles in our lives, and even then, before this virus thing hit, we were struggling with trusting God and trusting in the power of God. Do you realize that in your life, on the job, at school, in the family, in your health, at the doctor's office, everywhere you go, everywhere we go, we need to be able to trust in the power of God, in his power to do, and his will to know that he can do and will do what's needed, not what we want necessarily, but what is needed in every case. Someone said that worry is negative meditation. That's a good quote. Worry is negative meditation. And I have that problem. Sometimes I just get down and dragging because something's so heavy on my shoulders I feel like I can't stand up straight. And I'm wrong. When I do that, I'm wrong because that's a lack of faith and trust in an almighty, all-knowing God. There was a, a conference, a Bible conference going on in England several years ago. This is 100 or so years ago, close to 100, early 1900s. And there was, uh, it was a conference supposed to be on faith. And the conference was frankly not going very well. You had speakers speaking and teaching and so forth, but it was not going all that well And uh, in the sense that a lot of it was uh, book learning and theoretical and up there in the clouds and so forth. There was not much enthusiasm, not much stimulation in the crowd. And They were about to close and people were kind of just, okay, well, I came, didn't get much out of it, but they were kind of down and dragging after this conference on faith. It didn't really help them seemingly very much. And this elderly gentleman raised his hand. He said, before we close, gentlemen, do you mind if I come forward and say a word? Well, some of the people knew him. And they said, yeah, go ahead and do it. What it was, was this was an elderly missionary that had spent many, many years in China. He says, let me tell you what faith can do by a personal experience that we had there in China. And he often preached on faith to his people way in the remote mountain areas and the highland mountain areas of inner China. I often preached to our people on faith and told them how much they needed to live by faith. And the, the time came one time where we had a famine in our area. It was a bad famine, and our people were starving, literally starving. There was just nothing. The, the famine, the, the drought, and everything had come, and they couldn't raise crops. The crops were just not producing, and our people were starving. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we got together and told them how great a God we served, and God can do anything. And then one day, while we were praying, during this time of prayer, a storm came up. You see, there's mountain ranges over here, and there's mountain ranges over here, and over on those mountain ranges on this side here, a storm was raging on the other side of those mountains and that mountain range over there. And that storm came over that mountain range and down into our valley. And when it did, it rained beans upon our village and our whole area. It rained beans and beans and beans fell from the sky. Well, the people couldn't believe it. They went out and they picked up beans. You thought it was manna from heaven. And they picked up beans by the buckets, by the baskets full. They carried them home and they had plenty to cook. They had plenty to sow in their fields for the next crop. And they only found out later that on the other side of that mountain, they had plenty of rain. They had plenty of crops. The crops were doing well. And the storm came through there and sucked up more beans than you can imagine, carried them into the clouds and over the mountain peaks and deposited them like rain will do. The, the people on the other side of the mountain still had plenty of beans, not as much as before, but they had beans that they shared with the people on this side of those mountains and didn't even know they were doing it. But he said, if you doubt my word, he pulled a, a bottle out of his pocket, pocket and he said, if you want to see some of those beans that I collected, he said, these are some of the beans that God rained upon our people out of the sky. And he had a jar of them in his hands. That woke those people up to the word faith and trusting God in the power of God. Who else would have ever dreamed that God would answer a prayer by a rainstorm of beans upon a starving people? But he did, because you see, God is all powerful. Jesus said, not my will, but thine, because you can do anything, so I'm trusting you to do what's right and to do the right thing in the right way. I don't know if the name of Brian Bedford means much to you, but he's the CEO of Frontier Airlines. Here's this statement that he made. 
When in times of crisis, you have two options, running from God or turning to him. Simple phrase from the CEO, Brian Redford of Frontier Airlines. When in times of crisis, you have two options, running from God or turning to him. Good thought, because you see, sometimes we just do the opposite, don't we? When the hard times hit, we, we, we retreat, we seclude ourselves. Some people quit going to church, others uh, quit reading their Bibles, others can't seem to see, be able to pray anymore. But we retreat instead of running to God. You see, God, Jesus said, God can do anything. Have faith in him, have faith in him. But there's something else he did. He trusted in the power of God, but Jesus also trusted in the wisdom of God, in the wisdom of God. Turn over to Matthew. Matthew, if you will, please. Chapter 26. Matthew 26. I'll give you time to find it. Just a, a couple of short verses. Matthew 26. We'll just be looking at four passages this morning. This is the third. Matthew 26 and verse 39. Matthew 26 and verse 39. Here again, this is Jesus. This is what's going on with Jesus. Now we're reading this same story in a different passage, but sometimes one gospel writer will say something that the other just didn't say, so we put it all together. In Matthew 26, verse 39, here's what he said. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Notice verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. You see, not only he was trusting in the power of God, but he was trusting in the wisdom of God. God knows best. God simply knows best. You see, what's happening in your life uh, didn't take God by surprise. The, the struggles and the troubles and the trials you're going through didn't take God by surprise, nor is he shorthanded. He knows exactly what he's going to do. You see, most of the time, I don't even know what I'm going to do, let alone what he's going to do. How do you expect me to know what God is going to do and what his plans are? And I don't even know half the time what I'm doing. And uh, my wife will tell you that. <laughs> and this is the way we are. We are weak. We are fragile. And we don't have the wisdom. That's why we should do as the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, James 1.5 that giveth to all men liberally and upgradeth not. That means he doesn't go back on what he said. And I'm not talking about giving us man's wisdom. I have a little f fraction of man's wisdom. I'm not looking for man's wisdom. I'm looking for God's wisdom. He says, if any man lack wisdom, God's wisdom, his wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. But we don't ask, do we? We don't ask for his wisdom, not to to be politically correct, but to be godly correct with what God is telling us and showing us. Jesus expressed what he would like to see happen, but he submitted it all to the will and the wisdom of God. He's, and we have a right to do that. Heavenly Father, here's a need. I sure would like to see you do this. I sure would like to see you do that. However, like Jesus said, may thy will be done because you know best, you know what's right. He trusted the wisdom of God to know what was best for him. We often fail greatly in this respect. And we try sometimes, frankly, in our prayers, our prayers, many times, we are trying to impose our will on God. Many times in our prayers, that's what we're doing. We're trying to corner God into answering our prayers the way we want. Instead of saying, Heavenly Father, you do it what you want and the way you want. Uh, we need to ask God to bless uh, us in a way that his will is accomplished, not to just go out and do something and hope that somehow God will bless the mess that we made of it. Many times that's what we do. We make decisions and we do things and then we pray that God will somehow be able to bless that thing I did. Instead of saying, God, you do it. Just let me be the tool in your hand that gets it done. This explains why so many Christians are unhappy, why they're nervous, why they're depressive and despondent, because submission brings peace. Rebellion does not. Obstinance does not. Being mule-headed does not. Uh, being self-centered does not. But submission brings peace. And submission alone will bring peace. And that's why so many of our Christians don't have peace. They are not submitted. So many of our church members do not have peace because they are not totally submitted 
to the will and the wisdom of the Father. We don't trust God to know what's best in our lives, and we pay the price for it by nervousness and popping pills and seeing doctors and all these other things that happen. And believe me, I've been there just like the worst of them. <laughs> I've been there before, too, when things fell apart and I couldn't seem to handle it. I couldn't seem to understand, couldn't get a grip on it. And I paid the price for not just simply submitting myself to the almighty power and wisdom of God. But let's look at the last thing before time runs out this morning, if you will, please. Jesus did trust in the power of God. He trusted in the wisdom of God. But we also see that he trusted just simply in the love of God. He trusted in the love of the Father. Notice in John 17. John 17. And just a short passage. It'll be the last passage for this morning. In John 17. <clears throat> verse 23. John 17, verse 23. Through the end of the chapter, that's just about four verses. John 17, verse 23 through verse 26, the end of the chapter. Here's what he said, John 17, 23. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father. Now that's the Son talking to God the Father. And that's just a lovely expression. O righteous Father. O righteous Father. May we not forget that when we pray. O righteous Father. The world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known thee, known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Love is all about love. The love of the Father for you and me. And what kind of a father is it that, would, like the Bible says, if a person asks for a loaf of bread, give him a stone, or uh, ask for a piece of meat, give him a, a, a serpent. No, that's not a loving father. That's not the kind of God that we serve. You serve a God that loves us. When the things happen to us, sometimes we get bitter because we think God's against us. He's never been against us. Even before we were saved, he wasn't against us. He was against our sins. He was trying to draw us to himself. But sometimes we get bitter because we think, well, God doesn't love me anymore. If he loved me, he wouldn't let this happen. If he loved me, he wouldn't let this go on and on and on without an answer. But he answered he just didn't answer the way you and I wanted. It's, the answer didn't come in the time frame we wanted. There's a lot of things we mix into it, but it doesn't change the fact that God loves me. He loves me, and he knows what he's doing in his power and in his wisdom and in his love, just like Jesus tried to teach his disciples, we can trust him. Uh, he never doubted the love of God when they wanted to stone him, when they betrayed him, when his disciples fled before the the judgment time that Christ went through. The Bible says that every single one, not just Peter, but every single one of the disciples fled. When the people cursed him, when the people uh, were against him, when he had to leave their midst, uh, uh, no doubt supernaturally because they were wanting to stone him. When all these things happened, when he was betrayed time and time again, he never once doubted of the love of God. And neither should you and I. It's a terrible thing to forget how much someone loves you. That's the reason why Naomi came back to Israel after exile and lost her husband and lost her boys and came back and lost one daughter-in-law, came back with, with Ruth. She says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Mara. Call me Mara. I'm not Naomi anymore. Just call me Mara. And Mara just simply means bitter. It's a word that just means bitter. She says, I'm not Naomi anymore. I'm bitter. Just call me bitter. And she'd for forgotten so much of the love of God and the consequences of sin in our lives. Children sometimes see their whole lives ruined because no one in their home and their family loves them. Marriages are broken when love is not present. The vows still say for better or for worse, but that for worse part has gone out the window for many couples today because it's for better only. If the worst hits, I'm out of here. Love should be at the basis of that. We need uh, love and respect for our military, for our men in blue. Uh, last year uh, in the springtime, I was preaching in a church down at, at uh, Jonesboro. 
and uh, got there to be able to present the uh, Bible project going into uh, Papua New Guinea. And uh, I just saw the pastor of that church uh, on television yesterday as they raised up a, a large offering to honor and respect the men in blue in their area. Their church did a great thing to respect and honor the military. I was in that church twice last year in the springtime. And the pastor, Cleek, is a great, great guy. I thank the Lord for what he's doing to show respect for our military and for our men in blue and doing what they can as just a small group of people to be able to reach out and touch the community out of respect when our men in blue have been taking such a beating. Praise the Lord for Brother Cleek and what he's doing. Uh, I remember years ago, as I hurry along, I should have about five minutes if my timing is right. But I remember years ago when I was in Bible college, there was a young fellow that came into school that uh, just seemed to be different. He, he wasn't quite the same as other guys. It, some guys were irritated with him. Uh, I didn't feel like there was anything to be irritated with. He just seemed to be somebody that had some hang-ups and problems. And, and it seemed like that uh, in his life there was something back there that was causing him to just not be an easy person to get along with. Well, I found out the story. I found out the story with time, and so did a lot of others, and it changed their opinions on this young man. Because, you see, he came from a very wealthy family, very wealthy family. They said they were Christian, church members, church goers, said that they knew God, but uh, like so many people, uh, there was something lacking and missing terribly. You see, they were an upper crust people, wealthy people. They were a country club type of people. They loved the jet set, the country clubs, going out to the golf club and drinking and hobnobbing with their upper crust friends. And, and they didn't really want to have a child. And here he came along, and, and so there he was, and he was growing up in the home, and they had to raise him, but he was a hindrance to them and to their lifestyle and the way they wanted to live. And, and they just didn't want a child. They didn't want that boy. And uh, yet they had to keep him until he reached of age. And when he reached age to be uh, mature, I think it was at the age of 18, they came to him and they said, okay, we'll make a deal with you. We'll make a deal with you. We'll give you $6 million if you promise to leave and never come back. How's that for a mom and dad? We'll give you $6 million once for all. Take it and leave. Don't ever come back. We don't want to ever see you again. And that $6 million will take care of you for probably the rest of your life if you handle it well. Do you think that $6 million really replaced the love of a mom and dad? Do you think that has anything to do with the word love and the hearts and lives of anybody today? When I heard that story, that I understood why that dear guy, that dear fellow had so many psychological hang-ups and problems. How could you not be disturbed and bothered by something like that? Those six million dollars never even came close to replacing the love of a mom and dad. The love of God. Never doubt it. Never uh, think small of it. Never belittle the love of God for you and your life because Jesus certainly did not. He trusted in the power of God. He trusted in the wisdom of God. And he certainly trusted in the love of God. That was Jesus' example. Can we do any better than following the example of Jesus? And I'll close on this one last thought. There was a woman one time that had quite a reputation for really loving God and being a faithful woman, a woman of faith that loved God and served him faithfully. One day another woman came to her that didn't know her real well, but came to her and she said, are you the woman with the great faith? She said, well, no. I am not the woman with the great faith, but I am the woman with a little faith in a great God. That's the difference. She, you see, she did have a little faith, but she knew where she placed it. She knew where she'd put it. Are you the woman? Are you the lady? Are you the man with a great faith? Now, I don't think any of us could say, yeah, that's me. No. But we can say, yeah, I, I'm a person that has a little faith, but I know where I put it. I put it in a great God. And Jesus showed us the way by these three examples that we tried to look at today of how Jesus reacted to the Father. And if, if we can follow the example of Jesus, I think we'll be doing all right. Don't you? Don't you? Let's close in a word of prayer, if you will, please. And if anybody needs to say a word afterwards, whether Brother Stover or someone else, I'll close in prayer. And if there's anything else to be said or done, feel free to do it, if you will. Heavenly Father, we can never find a better example in anything than Jesus, your son that you loved dearly. 
And as it broke your heart to look down from heaven, to see him bruised and battered and beaten and then crucified, how it broke your heart to look down upon your beloved son that went through all of that for the likes of us. He did it for us. And yet along the way before that happened, he tried to point his disciples in the right direction and therefore pointing us in the right direction and how to put our faith and our love and our trust in you as our heavenly father because you do love us. You have the power to do what's right. You have the wisdom to know how to do what's right. And you'll do what's right because you love us. And you even love the sinners. That's why you're so patient with them, far more patient than we would be. You're patient because you love them too. Dear God, help us to learn these simple lessons from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and be able to go out of here better for it. We would ask in Jesus' lovely, precious name. Amen. Amen. Does anybody have a word that you have to say, brothers?